Okay, hello again. Um, a very astute question came up uh, regarding the introductory lecture to Hamilton's principle about this delta function. And I think it's actually worth talking about because you will see this forever in a lot of physics. A lot of thermodynamics uh, uses this kind of notation too. And I got to admit, I took it, usually I don't take these things for granted. And the whole point of my lecture series is to kind of demystify stuff like this and to make this kind of ad hocish notation manifestly clear, right? And this one kind of got by me, I got to admit. Um, I don't think it was incomprehensible, don't get me wrong, but I do feel like unpacking this delta notation is worth a little bit of trouble. You can skip this lecture if it wasn't an issue, but I want to do this. So the way we're going to end up doing this is we're going to end up executing this least action integral using a little bit more of a formal procedure that evades this delta. And then we're going to reinsert the delta so we see exactly how the delta shorthands for the formal procedure. All right? So beginning, the action integral is exactly what we described before. Uh, the generalized coordinate, q of t, the, the generalized velocity, q prime of t, as, as an integral with respect to t. And we've got the, the Lagrangian, which I was calling the mysterious Lagrangian because it's a function whose essence we don't necessarily know from first principles. Uh, it's where we attack it with guesswork, although I don't know if that's the right way to say it. The guesswork sort of is first principles, right? I guess what we say is we don't have a a deductive method starting from some first principles to give us the Lagrangian. Is that the way to say it? I don't know. I mean, when you're at this level of the bottom of physics, I guess you could say things a lot of different ways and it would be sensible from because you can approach it from different angles. The point is, is the Lagrangian is a function we have to presume is given. And we're, this analysis doesn't depend on it uh, in too many ways. I mean, there's always some you know, necessary and sufficient conditions and things like that. But anyway, so this is the action principle that we're dealing with, the, or the action integral that we're dealing with. Now, what we're going to do this time, though, is we're going to examine this generalized coordinate, which is a function of time, and we're going to blow it up into two parts. We're going to add, first of all, another variable to it, alpha. So Q is not only a Q function of time, it's also a function of alpha. But we want it to be very clear that if we set alpha to be zero, Q is only a function of time. So we need to create something where when alpha is zero, Q is a function of time only, um, or, or, or I should say when, uh, well, I guess it's always a function of time. So what I'm trying to say is when alpha is zero, we end up with Q of T, the same Q of T we were talking about earlier. And when alpha is not zero, we're adding in a certain amount of some other arbitrary function eta whose only constraints are that eta at t equals uh, 1 and t equals 2, right? Eta at the two ends of the variation are 0. So we set alpha to equal 0, and we end up with just q of t. If alpha is not equal 0, we have some variation from the path that we expect. And this is how we formalize the notion of variation, where before we just added a little thing to it. Now we're going to formalize it with this function eta. You know, but it kind of proceeds from there pretty clearly. We replace q of uh, t with q of alpha and t in the expression for the action, where if we set alpha to equal zero, we have the exact same expression we have up here. And that's ensured by this, which I guess, in order to make this really ensuring, I would have to say that this equals q of t, which is the same q of t we're talking about right there, right? Okay. So now when we talk about minimizing the functional or minimizing the action, whoops, when we talk about minimizing the action, we're talking about, whoops, whoops, I've screwed up. We're talking about minimizing the action um, uh, we, we want this derivative of this action when alpha equals zero to be zero, right? That's equivalent to our principle of least action. It's finding the derivative of this guy when alpha equals zero. It's got to be zero. Now, 
that's necessary again, but it's not completely sufficient because there's a couple different ways it can be equal to zero. We're not going to worry about that too much right now. This isn't a study of the calculus of variations, by the way. This is just the principle of least action. We're assuming that this, we're, we're, we're finding this when we get a minimum, right? So to do this calculation, it's not so hard. We just have to take the derivative of f and s with respect to alpha. Notice we integrate with respect to t. That clears t, but it leaves an alpha behind in this version of things. So s is now a function of alpha. I guess I should have made that clear, right? You know, here, s is only a function of t, so you end up with a number. But now you end up with some function of alpha left behind. And what you're looking for is the derivative of that function of s with respect to alpha when alpha equals uh, the value of that derivative when alpha equals zero. That's going to be our least action point. So with calculating this derivative, now <coughs> to make things worse, I've, I'm just I'm getting rid of the functional dependence on alpha and t. But you have to understand there is a functional dependence of alpha and t in Q, and L has an implicit functional dependence on alpha and t. Because I don't want to carry around these arguments everywhere. You know, it gets to be a mess. So now that I'm looking for this, I take advantage of the fact that Q alpha and T is Q zero of T plus alpha of eta T. So partial Q partial alpha is in fact eta T, right? Because this doesn't depend on alpha. So, and this doesn't depend on alpha. This only depends on time. Eta only depends on time. So you take the derivative, you're left with eta of T. And then Q, the partial of Q dot with respect to alpha ends up being d a to d t, which we'll call a to dot. And of course, I should always remember, a to dot itself is a function of time. All right, so, so this, this is now how we understand a to t is d q d alpha and, no, a to of t, and then d a to d t is d q dot d alpha. And this is, these are the two dependent variables uh, in the, or independent variables of the Lagrangian. So you, using this process, taking this derivative with respect to alpha is pretty easy. It's just going to be dl dq dq d alpha and dl dq dot dq dot d alpha. But we just went to the trouble of figuring out that those two things were these etas. Oops, that should be an eta dot, right? Eta dot, I think. Yeah, because it's a, it's dq dot d eta and d, uh, no, dq dot d alpha and dq dot d alpha is eta dot. Okay, so there we have this expression for the uh, partial derivative of the action with respect to alpha. Now, you could argue that I shouldn't even use a partial derivative here, right, because there's no other, uh, I mean, we've integrated out everything else. Yeah, not, not, not worried about it. Okay, so the next step is that uh, that integration by part step. It's, and it's really the same. I mean, this analysis is really the same, right? The integration by part is, is designed to get rid of eta dot. And so I reproduce that integration by parts here, but you've got the same story. You end up with a, uh, a boundary term that's zero because eta of t1 and eta of t2 are both zero, so this part goes away. Right, so that part goes away, and then this other part does in fact stay, but you'll notice that there's no eta dot, it's been replaced with eta, and we have this derivative term of dl dq dot, and making that substitution gives me this Lagrange equation, just like before, but the difference now is we've got this eta t function, which is an arbitrary function, as that's our arbitrary variation, and in this case, although the variation goes to zero at the endpoints, this does not have to be infinitesimal, right? Alpha is the thing that drives the infinitesimal nature of everything, right? It's, it's, this could be some huge thing. As long as it's zero at T1 and T2, this could be gigantic. Alpha is what keeps this small. And we're looking for ds d alpha. So, we're, you know, we're, we're probing the local area of this action as we change alpha. But alpha is going to be what's driving the size of everything. So uh, where was I? So we end up with this. this is, now, this is the same Euler-Lagrange equation, right? We just done it very formally, and we never use the little delta symbol, right? 
And so now let's go back. And now we're going to introduce this, this delta symbol, right? What I'm going to do is this side is ds d alpha. This is ds d action d alpha. I'm going to multiply by a regular differential of d alpha, and I'll get partial s partial alpha d alpha. And then this eta t is dq d alpha. But if I multiply by d alpha over here, I multiply by d alpha on the right and the left, and I get this new object here and this new object here. This is what I call del s, and this is what I call del q, right? So now, if I were to, um, so if this is, let's see, del s, then uh, del s is equal to this del q, and that's the formula we derived in the previous expression, right? And now you take del q, and you can, you can literally distribute it in. You can put del q here and uh, del q here, right, by getting it out of there. So you've distributed it in. And um, so now we just call this guy. We, could, we, we, we take the del q out front by just defining how del behaves, right? And it's just a shorthand to kind of clear through this mess so we kind of don't have to play around with this formalism, right? So that is the shorthand for del, right? So the, the thing to remember is if you go through that formalism, you end up with this object here. Um, you end up with this object here and this object here. And that's where this little del comes into, okay? So uh, that explains the... The goal of this lesson was to explain the Dell shorthand, and I think that just about covers it. So I'm just going to add this as a little addendum lecture to the uh, introduction. Okay, uh, thank you very much.